as I said, we are so excited to get to talk to you about this third phase of the PREA work that's been happening in Washington State and to lay out what the timeline has been um, and is for going forward in terms of providing in-person services. In-person services should be available to facilities, prison facilities, by October 1st. In order to be able to go into the facilities and provide those services, there's a few things that programs will need to have in place before they're able to start providing those services at the facility. One of those things that we need your organization to do is to, one, have watched this webinar, so please make sure that anybody who will be going into a facility has reviewed this material and the supplemental material that will be being sent to you. This webinar will be archived and included on our Moodle site, so they will be able to access that shortly after this webinar. They will need to meet with the Department of Corrections for a facility orient and review the facility orientation webinar. That is the webinar that is going to be made special for you as advocates, and what it's doing is it's condensing down a volunteer training that every person who goes into a Department of Corrections facility needs to take. That's a multi-hour training, but we've worked with DOC to shrink that down to a shortened webinar specific for you so you can meet the criteria of having reviewed the material necessary to enter a facility. That material will be in a webinar format for you to review before services on October 1st. It is our hope to have that webinar available to you by September 1st, but there is the potential that it might be pushed out one more week, and we'll keep you informed on what that timeline is via our PREA listserv. And if you have any questions, if you're looking for that, don't hesitate also to contact Kelly and myself, and we'll let you know where that is in timeline. It is going to be very important that you have some specific follow-up with your facility after viewing that orientation webinar because there are a few pieces that are going to be very specific to your facility. As in, you will have to identify where the emergency location is that you should go to if there were an emergency in the facility. So that will be a one-on-one -on -one conversation that you're going to need to work out with your facility. We will also have those materials available for you, just as reminders of the things that you need to follow up with your facility after watching that orientation video. We are curious if we could get a show of hands. On the left-hand side of your chat box, you can click and it says hand raise. If, how many of you have already started talking about your facility around providing these in-person services? So Kelly and I are looking at all the hands being raised. And it is the majority of the participants. So that is very exciting and great. It shows that those relationships are moving forward and that you are preparing for your in-person services. Um, if you haven't thus far, this is a really opportune time to meet with your facility and start talking about what needs to be in place so you can be ready to provide services by October 1st, as that is the, the goal for the state for the entire rollout of in-person services at all facility, at all DOC facilities. And you can go ahead and unraise your hand. Thank you for that. So we want to share a little bit with you about some of the guidance information that we have worked with um, Office of Crime Victims Advocacy as well as the Department of Corrections to develop so we can share out with you um, the pieces of information that you will want to be thinking about as um, the advocacy organization going into the facility. We really want to thank you um, also for your valuable input and your thoughts and your questions that you've shared with us through webinar formats and TA so we could bring in those questions uh, into those conversations with OCBA and the Department of Corrections because they really did help inform how we crafted this service guidance document that will be being provided to you and we'll be talking about each piece of the guidance document within this webinar today. The guidance document really is going to be your scaffolding, it's your template, um, it's your tool for 
really leading a conversation through um, or with your uh, facility around developing your local protocols for response at that facility. Each facility's response is going to look slightly different when it comes to in-person services in terms of potentially where will we meet, how will we coordinate that, who will be the person that will escort me in and out of the building. So there will be some nuances that have to be um, facility determined with you um, as well. So we'll provide you some guidance on what those areas are that you're going to want to be thinking about, but it's not something that we as a state could necessarily just streamline a specific meeting location because we really want to make sure that your safety is at the forefront, the safety of the facility, and that confidentiality remains a paramount for the incarcerated survivor. In terms of how um, individuals will be able to be connected with you for in-person services, at this time when we have developed the in-person services, individuals that you would be providing services to within the incarcerated setting would have already had a contact through the initial hotline. So that means that they will have already contacted Megan or been patched through to you um, at your advocacy center. So this will be someone that you are already familiar with. And we, that's really important at this point want now because we want to ensure that there's an appropriate use of services. We also want to ensure that we have your safety at the forefront. And as well, for us to help gauge really what is the utilization of the services. We want to make sure um, that we have the resources to meet that and that you're spending your resources wisely in being at the facility and that the facility is also using the resources. Um, in that stewardship. It's going to help us uh, collect data, of course, which is further going to support our ability to um, resource this work appropriately and make sure that the way the service system is set up is manageable and sustainable. Okay, everyone. Um, this is Kelly now. Hi. And Andrea was just talking about um, who you're going to be doing these in-person services with initially. We want to get into some of the nitty-gritty details. As she said, we can't tell you exactly all of the answers because it's something that has to be worked out facility to facility, but we want to provide you with some guidance in a couple of categories. Um, one of those is meeting frequency and length. This is something um, that you brought up to us as a question and that we've discussed at length with our DSC partners at the statewide level. So um, you are going to have to work out locally a, a regular day and time. Um, the suggested frequency is one time per week, but that's really something that you need to figure out with your location in terms of capacity, um, your capacity to, uh, to go to that location, and then also what survivors' needs seem to be. Um, that can change over time, the frequency, if it seems like it needs to be more often. But uh, DOC um, has agreed that it should be a specific day and period of time that is regular. Um, so we just want to ask you to think about why do you think a regular day and time might be a good idea for, you know, for any of the partners involved? If you have thoughts about that, go ahead and type it into the chat box. Seems like you are all thinking about that, which is great. Um, consistency, predictability, build stability in the system. Set time is good for planning and staffing, exactly. Yeah, these are some of the things that we have thought about um, in terms of why a set day and time is good. Um, it's, consistency is good for survivors. There's expectations of when the next time you might be able to meet with them is. It's good for DOC because they have really regimented schedules in their facilities and they need to know how to plan around um, an extra person being in their facility on a particular day. And like you all said, um, planning for coverage at your community program and planning for staffing. That's definitely, these, these considerations were things that we heard from you and from DOC that we really 
um, thought about in order to determine why a regular day and time. Another point is credibility. That's great. Thank you for sharing those ideas. Those are definitely things that we thought about and we um, heard from you. We appreciate that you see that as well. So in terms of length, um, the suggested length for an in-person meeting is an hour. And um, do, we've heard from DOC that it's really important to keep to the arranged time of the meeting. So, um, you know, if you're meeting with someone in community, it's possible that if you get to discussing something, it may go over your allotted time. That may be okay if you don't have another appointment in this setting um, because of security and the regimented processes and schedules that each DOC facility has. We really need to stick to the allotted time that you have specified for meeting length. In terms of meeting location, this is something that's going to be a really important conversation that you have with um, your facility contact at DOC. So, um, and one of those considerations is because of confidentiality. So DOC staff, as you probably know, need to have sight or sound of the inmates in their facility. It's permissible for them to have sight through a window without being able to hear what is being said. Um, I know you probably remember us talking about this when you were selecting or trying to figure out a room in the hospital that you could have an exam, have um, support a survivor during a forensic exam at, and you were trying to select a room where the DOC staff could have sight of the survivor but not sound. This is going to be a similar consideration for finding a location for an in-person meeting in a DOC facility. There are a lot of possibilities there that you can check out in your facility. Um, one being men the mental health department at the facility may have a meeting room. Um, the medical section may have a meeting room. There are private meeting rooms that inmates use to meet with their attorneys. These are all things that look different in each facility, and so it's gonna be really important for you to go look at what is available and what might be an option. It's also important to select a room that's not in a location where there's a lot of foot traffic or other inmates or DOC staff will be walking past frequently. Um, one example of that is Andrea and I have been visiting various prison locations and we asked right away to see where the private meeting rooms are that folks might meet with their attorney in. And it turns out that those private meeting rooms have windows that face a very busy hallway um, that inmates go through to um, meet with other people on visiting day and are in a lot. There are snack machines in that area. Um, it, it would not be a location that would be uh, private for someone. It would identify them as having met with you. So an idea that we had um, that sounded like it would be a really great location for meeting was not going to be. So, you know, we can tell you all of these different options, but you're going to have to see what it looks like in your facility. We're just looking at questions as they're coming in real quick. So we had a great question come up just looking for a little bit of clarification as to if it was one hour is the recommended time that you are in the facility for the day or one hour was the recommended time for a session with um, a survivor. And it is one hour for a session with a survivor. So you'll need to work out with the facility um, how many survivors you might be seeing that day, and you'll want to think about budgeting that into your staff time as well. Um, you'll have to work out how long it might take them to get another um, inmate to you after you finish an appointment. You're definitely going to want to have enough time for the previous survivor to get brought back to their housing unit or their employment that they're um, in for that day or educational opportunity that they're in for that day without passing potentially another inmate being escorted from the, with the same guard um, as that could potentially identify them as a survivor who's coming to meet with the PREA advocate as well. So you're gonna just wanna work with your facility to think about time and what that looks like and how many individuals you might be able to meet with at a time. But it is very um, important as Kelly said to keep regimented to your time that you have um, with that survivor, one, for maintaining really good boundaries, and two, for uh, recognizing the schedules that the DOC is operating on and for them to be able to support their staffing um, to help escort individuals to meet with you as well. 
And Andrea brings up a really good point. Um, getting in and out of the DOC facility can take some time. Having your badge is going to streamline that, but that's also part of why a, a set day and time is good. So say it's um, every Thursday from 10 to 3 or every other Thursday from 10 to 3, that allow, you know, you, you are then in the facility and all you're, you know, having is um, appointments without having to, you know, try to go in and out in between each one. Um, and it will be, as we've mentioned, um, appointments that are set ahead of time with someone that you've been working with versus a drop-in setting. And that really is for your safety and for DOC's facility security. Another consideration for a meeting location is DOC staffing. So this is something that we talked about at length with our DOC partners at the statewide level, thinking about, um, as Andrea was just alluding to, um, having a correctional officer that is escorting each inmate to you for the meeting and then someone that is um, waiting outside with sight not sound of the meeting while it's taking place. So you're going to need to talk to your facility about that aspect of it and it may be something that they have not thought about with you know with thinking that this is coming up. So um, we've heard from DOC that if the meeting takes place in a visitation area and it's not on a regular visitation day, that may require DOC to have two staff, one to escort survivors, one to stand outside the door while the meetings are going, place, uh, are, are going to be in place. Whereas if the meeting takes place, um, for instance, in mental health, the escort may be necessary, but there will already be staff in that unit to be the person that's standing outside. So um, these are considerations on DOC's end that we just want you to be aware of that may come up in conversations with them when you're talking to your facility. Um, one consideration for mental health, it, 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 it's a sort of a clear preference from DOC that mental health is going to be one of the preferred locations for these meetings. Um, and for them, that's because it's in line with other call-out procedures. You've heard us talk about call out before. It's a list that many, many inmates are on on any given day that just tells them a location to report to. Um, it's common for inmates to be on call out to go to medical or mental health. It wouldn't out them as being someone who's meeting with an advocate. It would be in line with their regular call out procedures. Um, so that's something to keep into consideration in terms of confidentiality and also convenience for Department of Corrections. In terms of work release facilities, this is a whole different ballgame. Um, inmates and in work release can come to you and you know, meet with you in a normal private location in your, um, at your program or whatever that looks like that you determine um, with that facility. Something that we've talked about a little bit before is that in order for someone at a work release to do that, they need to have what's called a point-to-point -point pass that says they're going to go to your agency. Um, they need to obtain that and sometimes um, staff at their facility would want to call and check that they actually went to the place that they said that they were going to. So you need to have an upfront conversation with the work release inmates that you're working with um, to say, do you want me to confirm that you were here if somebody calls? If so, work with them and sign a really limited written release of information that just says it is okay to confirm that I was here on this day and time. It doesn't need to be anything more than that. But you want to make sure you talk about that ahead of time because otherwise you're not going to be able to confirm that for them. So in terms of arranging a meeting, as we've talked about, you're going to be connecting through the OCBA hotline. So that initial screening is done either by you um, or by Megan to ensure that usage of the in-person meeting time is really for the purposes that are intended. Then, the, you, the community-based advocate, would get the survivor's name and phone number and contact your facility contact to arrange a meeting on the next available day that you're going to be at their facility. The facility contact should be the current person that you're already working with at your prison. So considerations there are we really want as few staff, as few DOC staff as possible to be involved in making these appointments. So it should be the person that you already have a connection with, whether that's the free liaison or someone else that's been designated um, to work with you. And we want you, um, when you're thinking about potential meeting times with the survivor, to be conscious of the fact that the survivor is likely usually obligated to be somewhere else during the meeting time, um, school, work, another program. 
your facility contact should know to avoid scheduling your appointment with the survivor during times where their absence would be problematic, for example, count time, where they really do need to be in a particular location. With work release, you can make that appointment directly with the survivor. And um, you know, just always keep in mind confidentiality. Another consideration is gonna be safety and security. I know that we have heard this from you. Most of you, if not all of you, have toured your facility and that's great. You have an idea of what kind of intense security looks like. So getting into the facility is the initial aspect of that. If you haven't been already, you will be issued a pink badge with your picture on it. Um, and you'll pick up that badge at the security checkpoint each time you enter the facility. The pink badge um, means under escort at all times. It's the badge that, that um, indicates that. But the picture on it is unique to, uh, to your um, situation. So you will be escorted to the meeting location and back out. You won't have to go find that on your own. You won't um, have free reign of the facility. This was something that DOC felt was the best way to ensure safety and security and that we felt was the best way to ensure your comfort um, being in that environment. We have established that you can bring in paper and pen if you want it, although we know that um, most of you don't take detailed notes during your advocacy sessions because of confidentiality considerations, but if should you need to bring in a pen and paper or, for instance, a release form or your intake paperwork, you will be able to do that. Um, nothing else, but that is what you will be able to bring in, which is different than what we've told you about the hospital, so we did want to make sure to relay that information. And this is Andrea. When you took your tours, you probably experienced this, but just as a reminder or a bit of new information for maybe your advocate who haven't gone into a facility before, when you go in, they do have lockers that they'll make available to you, so you'll be able to put your keys or your personal belongings into a locker at the facility before you enter into um, the main area of the prison. Thank you. We've talked with DOC about your safety, and they, that's something that they consider to be paramount, that we know you are concerned about, um, and we wanted to make sure to have extensive conversations about that. So one of those things is gonna to be to talk with your facility contact about um, a safety procedure. Um, you're coming into their facility, determine ahead of time how you'll signal to the officer outside the room if you feel unsafe during a meeting with a survivor. Um, all advocates will have available to them a pull alarm, screech alarm, or whistle. That's something that we're working out the logistics of, but there will be um, one in each facility for that will be available for you to use. Other options to discuss with your facility, um, some people may be comfortable doing a hand signal. Um, one facility in particular has indicated that because of particular security procedures there, all advocates will be issued a radio where they would be able to call someone. That's something that's gonna be unique to that facility that not everyone necessarily will use. And a lot of the rooms have a built-in alert button or panic button. So DOC, we just want to assure you, um, is really considering your safety. And they're the experts in keeping people safe in their facilities. So there will be that standard option of the alarm that each person will have available. But DOC will also be talking with you about other things that they would prefer for you to do based on their knowledge of their facility. And we just want you to listen to them and comply with that. Um, and just know that it's because they're really the experts in safety and security in their facility. One other thing that is a little unique is DOC staff um, will have discretion if on the day of your meeting with the survivor, something has happened unrelated that morning, the person is volatile, um, there's something going on that they think would create an unsafe environment for you to meet with them, um, they will contact you to cancel your scheduled meeting. And that's something you should work out the logistics for how that will happen, but just know that that is a possibility. And again, this is a time to defer to them in terms of, um, in terms of your safety and the security of their facility. Uh, you can always ask a question and they hopefully will be able to provide you some information, but we didn't want that to be a surprise to you that that, that, that might happen. Um, they're not trying to block your ex access, they're trying to protect your safety. So as we're talking about safety, this may be bringing up questions for you, and we just want to ask, um, what concerns do you have about safety, about going into facilities? Feel free to type those in the chat if you, um, if you want to do that.
So in terms of work release facilities specifically, um, this person will be in your office, meaning with you like um, other survivors that come to your office. So you would just follow your normal safety and security procedures in your office um, and have a conversation with staff about anything that may, you know, that may be triggered there for having someone come to your office. Seems like you're all thinking about possible safety concerns and considerations. We'll just give you a couple more minutes to think about that and type anything into the chat box so that we can address your concerns or bring those to DOC if it's not something we have the answer to right now. Andrea, I think it's important just to highlight that the mechanisms that you have to flag to an officer if you have any concerns um, are things that inmates are already familiar with in the facility. They're used to seeing screech whistles on other staff. Um, they are familiar that um, they have other signals worked out with staff. They don't necessarily know uh, what that is, um, but they are very mindful of the fact that they do have um, an individual standing outside um, paying attention to what's happening in the room. So um, it will be up to you to devise a unique signal with your uh, facility, but that is not something that is unusual to happen um, in a facility. So it sounds like one agency has talked about dispatching two advocates to the prison at a time because of the remote drive um, you know, those are some things to think about at your agency, what you think would be helpful for safety and security um, and, and your capacity to do something like that. And so that's a really great point, Kelly, that obviously your transportation time to the facility is something you need to think about in terms of client volume that you're able to uh, fill in one day. So if you have, you know, a, multi a couple hour drive, you may only have the opportunity to meet with two individuals that day just because the drive time and the escort time within the facility um, will equal up to your full day. But that's really for each facility to determine. We're just looking at the questions coming in. So there's a uh, question about um, if you're serving someone from work release and they are coming to your facility instead of you meeting with them at the prison um, and you won't know what their crime or conviction is, um, thinking about safety in your facility and, and what that might look like, um, I think we would just say you're probably serving people right now that have um, convictions and you're not aware of that. Um, so. As this person has indicated, we're not going to be asking people what their crime or conviction is. Um, so most likely that's not going to look any different than serving people in community now. Absolutely. And I think that's a really great conversation to be having with your work release facility. Anyone who's under the custody, if they have certain restrictions on their access and community, um, the facility, of course, will know about that and shouldn't allow a point-to-point -point path to somewhere where, let's say there's a restriction on being around children, where children might be at your facility. So that is a really important conversation to have with your work release facility and just ensure that they know what your criteria is at your organization so they can make sure that anybody who may have that restriction isn't receiving that point-to-point -point path. Great. Great point, Andrea. Thank you. If others have suggestions about that as well, feel free to type them into the chat and we can share those with the group. So in terms of confidentiality, um, this is obviously a consideration. There are people that are going to know um, why you are coming to a facility, but they won't know why you're meeting with any individual in particular. Um, you can, you know, in terms of forms, you can bring in that intake paperwork and complete it. Um, in most cases, we'll talk a little bit later about inmates that are in um, intensive management units or high security units and how that might look a little bit different. 
So when talking with someone over the hotline about scheduling an appointment, you'll need to get an oral release of information from them because you have to contact the facility in order to arrange to have that meeting with them. Um, it can be extremely limited to just, you know, is it okay with you if I call this person at your facility to arrange to meet with you next Thursday? Um, and when you meet with them in person, you'll be able to sign a release of information for making future appointments. It really, there just is no way around that in this situation. You're not gonna have the opportunity to fill out a form with them until you meet with them in person. That is different than other work that you do. In some ways, it's not. You talk to people on the crisis line sometimes um, that you don't meet with in person for quite a, you know, quite a period of time into your service. So in talking with facility staff, you want to discuss the confidential nature of your meetings with survivors with your facility contact and anyone else involved in scheduling and transporting. Um, just because I think it can be natural for uh, facility staff to want to know why you're, um, why you're in their facility on a particular day. So we just want to think, spend a little bit of time thinking about um, how would you respond if the officer transporting a survivor to meet with you asks you why you're meeting with them. Or if you have an officer transporting you to the location for the day, um, you know, if they just ask you, oh, why are you here in our, in our facility today? What kind of conversations could you have with them that would protect confidentiality of the survivors that you're meeting with? a complicated thing and I know you're all thinking about it. It definitely wouldn't be uncommon to be asked that. So we want you to feel prepared and thinking about what your response might be. And certainly the institutions um, will be instructed that they are not uh, to inquire, but I think that's certainly just the nature um, in terms of enhanced security at the facility that you would be asked. Okay, so we do have some examples coming up, Kelly. Yeah, just a, a very easy, oh, I'd like to tell you, but for confidentiality reasons, I can't. Sure. So what about conversations that you can have ahead of time before this happens um, with folks at your facility? I think having the conversation ahead of time doesn't necessarily prevent question asking, but it will help in a lot of ways alleviate the issue of them identifying you as the advocate. So what we're thinking about is if you come into a facility and you're, you know, you're being transported to your meeting location for the day that you're going to be meeting with survivors at and the DOC staff person with you is saying, to eat at each security checkpoint, oh, I've just got the PREA person or I've just got the advocate that I'm, you know, I'm bringing. Um, we want to avoid that situation where everyone in the, you know, in the facility, people who don't need to know are aware of who you are and where you're going because then that is going to create a situation that outs the survivors that you're working with. And so we do have just a clarifying question in terms of who on the DOC staff knows who is coming into the facility. It is going to be the person who coordinated the appointment that you're working with on a regular that knows that you're coming into the facility and when you're coming into the facility and who you're meeting with. Those individuals are placed on a call-out list. So they trans the person who's transporting the inmate to your meeting would not necessarily know that they are coming um, to an appointment, they might just be escorting somebody to a visiting room or to mental health, but not know exactly what they're going there for. Um, and so we really just wanted to have you think about, well, what would you say if you were walking down the hallway with that transport officer and they ask you a question? Yeah. Um, it is also very likely that you will be transported into the room first and have the person standing out, have a person standing outside well 
that the other person is going and getting the incarcerated person to come meet with you. It would not be likely that you would be um, going to where the incarcerated person is and walking to your meeting place together. So those, those, that should not happen. They should be two separate um, movements within the facility. Yeah. Um, another reason, as Andrea says, this, it would be common to have these questions is partially because of your badge. A pink badge with a picture, is no one else has that um, at DOC, so it's possible that just because of that, someone who is transporting you may ask, oh, I've never seen that before. You know, do you work here? What are you doing here? Um, so thinking about having those conversations ahead of time and how to respond on the spot is going to be really helpful. Um, you know, it's possible that your DOC facility will work out to have the same, you know, same person transport you every time and have the, that person may be aware that you are a pre advocate coming from your program. Um, they may be able to do that because you have a particular set day and time. So that person may be aware. Um, and one thing that we are working on um, with Department of Corrections is um, a video about victim advocacy. And what they've suggested is that a transport officer who is regularly involved may watch a short video about victim advocacy um, ahead of time so that they know that your services are confidential, you know, generally what kind of services are provided, but it would help them understand why you're in facility and that it wouldn't be appropriate to ask detailed questions about who you're meeting with. So as we mentioned a little bit ago, we want to um, talk a little bit um, about considerations for meeting with a survivor who's in an intensive management unit or a high security unit. The meeting location will not be the same as for other survivors that you're working with. Um, all IMU units have a no contact visit booth, um, and that is where these meeting locations will take place. That is something that we can pretty standardly say across the board is what that's going to look like um, in facilities that have those kind of units. So in those situations, um, the correctional officer would have sight of the survivor, um, but you would be um, on, on one side of a no contact booth and they would be on the other side. You would be able to see them, um, but you would not be in the same physical space. You can't pass anything through to them. Um, so this would be used in lieu of your other meeting location. So if you're on the hotline and you're talking with someone about setting up an appointment, um, you may not know what unit they're in. Just you know, That might not be something that they've told you, and that's fine. Um, but how would that impact how you're talking with somebody on the hotline about the in-person meeting if you're preparing them for meeting with you? We're just we'll, we're watching the, the comments come in, and I think it's such a great question, Kelly, in terms of how you think about how you want to tailor your advocacy um, to the individual who's calling around that, because it's really important that we do know um, where you're going to be meeting with that individual, just so you can explain to them a little bit about what to expect. So that's going to look a little different if they're in an IMU uh, setting or in a different in the, in the regular part of the facility. Mm -hmm. So if you're having that conversation, you may just say to them, um, sometimes I meet with people in mental health for people that are in an intensive management unit. We meet in the no contact booths that are in that unit. Um, so that if you don't know, you're just saying both of these options are completely normal and it won't have anything, you know, in particular to do with you. Yeah, and I think that gets exactly what you're looking, you're looking for. Um, they'll be able to have information in terms of what to expect as to where they might meet with you, and you don't have to specifically then ask them what unit they're housed in. Yeah, that's your DOC facility. Contact responsibility to make sure, based on knowing that inmate, where the meeting should take place. And also, Kelly, that's an important thing to think about because from when you had your contact to when you have your meeting, that person's housing status might have changed. They might have been moved to an IMU or out of an IMU. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, and yeah, lots of considerations there. So an, another consideration is use of restraints. Um, when you're meeting with folks in your regular meeting location, that's not something that you will see. Um, however, other than um, 
this situation in which restraints will be used to transport um, the person to the, to the no contact visit booth. They will then be taken off when they are secured in the no contact booth. So you will see that in this situation. Um, one thing that you may have already thought as we're talking about this is that um, filling out forms is gonna be complicated. And that is something we really want you to think about. Um, the no contact room does not allow for you passing paper back and forth for the survivor to sign. And we have heard explicitly from DOC staff um, that if they saw a form that said anything about a sexual assault that occurred in facility that they would take that as an obligation to investigate and report. So you're gonna be passing, a, you, if you need somebody to sign a form, you can pass it from um, to the correctional officer and they will give it to the survivor. You need to be thinking about what you're putting on that form. Um, you know, you can put very basic information as basic as possible that would not have anything that would indicate um, anything occurred in facility because DOC staff has an obligation there that they will have to follow if they see it. All right. So this is a um, crash course from me and Andrea in terms of what the guidance document says. Um, it contains quite a bit more detail than we've gone over here, including some examples. Um, as Andrea said at the beginning, it's something that I'll be emailing to all of you after this with the slides. And of course, it's something that you can always ask questions about.